Hey everyone, and welcome to the black and white category. It's Friday. It's the end of the busy week. Tomorrow we'll go over all of the portfolios. But today, the category that everyone loves the most, black and white. So, started off with just a photo I took uh, actually a little bit more than a year ago. I'm sneaking this one in from, from late 2021. Just an example of a black and white photo that I was pretty happy with. Shows a number of the different things black and white does really well texture, tone, contrast, and detail, things like that. So, and also thought I'd start this video off with a bit of a smiling face. So, this was, as is always the case, the most entered contest. So, spend a little bit less time on each of these, probably, than the rest of the photos, uh, just in the name of, of keeping everyone uh, not bored. But we're going to start here with a photo from Joey Scannell of a can't tell what kind of bird it is in the park. From a technical perspective and a developing perspective, there's a lot of things going on really well here. We can tell by the shadows that this was probably a somewhat overcast day, but the trees are still casting a shadow so that so it wasn't uh, super bright or, or it wasn't also super dark. But even though uh, even taking that into account, you can still make out details within the shaded area of the photo. There's detail, a little bit of detail within the trees, and of course on the ground underneath them and so forth. And then the foreground, which is outside of those trees, is not super blown out. But one of the big challenges with this photo is that the um, plane of focus is behind what I assume to be the subject of the bird. So the bird's blurry, but then the grass is behind it or in focus. And that's going to come from one thing we can tell about this photo is that it's shot wide open. We can tell that by the blurry areas on the side, especially the right side of the photo, being uh, pretty dominant there, and also by the shallow depth of field. So um, if not wide open, then pretty darn close to wide open. The specular, hi the specular highlights in the background also look like they're from a lens which was shot wide open. Uh, at any rate... Um, so, so there's that, but when you, you know, one of the problems with shooting wide open, especially in a setting like this, is that if you move just slightly, then your, your depth of field, or your plane of sh sharpness, rather, is going to move really dramatically as well. Same thing as when you're taking a picture of an animal. If it moves, it's going to very easily move out of your uh, plane of sharpest focus. Here's another photo from Rod Stewart. Well, not another. I mean, another from he he submitted. I think f for all categories. But here's another pinhole photo from Rod Stewart, and you can tell this is a pinhole by the characteristic flare pattern of the pinhole, and also the general softness and the glowiness of the image. So this is one of those images where it really is lined up very well. The perspective of this pinhole, which is a very wide angle pin pinhole, by the way is really fascinating because you get a lot of nice foreground and then a good sharp object in the middle and then out of uh, a background as well. And also you can see that this was lined up so that the gateway is right about where the pinhole is producing the sharpest amount of uh, the sharpest image. So, and then also the uh, characteristic flare halo of the, uh, of the pinhole really does a pretty good job of framing the central part of this image and separating it from the blurrier, darker periphery. So this, this image really came together very nicely. Here's a portrait from Ted Smith. And um, so some really good things going on with this, this portrait. You know exactly who the subject is, right? Because there's nothing in the background to confuse you. Also the subject, the depth of field, it's a very shallow depth of field but Ted absolutely nailed getting his subject's dominant eye in focus. So um, also the subject's face and hair have really good tonal range in them, even though the, uh, the blouse on her, what is her left shoulder on the right side of the image is pretty blown out in terms of highlights. And also one of the things that really, really works well is on the left side of the, of the frame for us, uh, the right side of the subject, it's like she, her hair and her face are just melting right into the background. So uh, from a technical perspective and a creative perspective, this is a really good photo. And um, this should indicate pretty early on in this video 
that the quality of photos we're going to have for the runners up and and the two uh, fi the two winners are also really good. This next photo comes from Cesar Rodriguez, and it's a photo of what appears to be a stack of clothes, right? I'm assuming there's no one under there, although I guess there's no reason there wouldn't be. Uh, anyway, what we're looking at here is a, a photo that would be a really good way to practice some, some lighting technique and also to see how a film works with contrast, tonal range, texture, grain, things like that. And still lives like this, things you can take around your house or set up with things that you have in hand, are really good ways to learn how a film works and practice things like composition and and also to get comfortable with a new stock of film when it comes to shooting things that you are super super interested in. So I do like the way that this is structured and that you've got three different tones of clothes and also three different textures and things like that. So I think it's a this is a really interesting way to approach a still life because it's telling you a lot about who owns these clothes. Are they, I mean, we could, we could infer a few things. Are they clean or dirty? They, they do look like they're probably clean. They're just stacked there. Is it laundry day or is this somebody who lives out of their clean clothes hamper? So it does raise a few questions and hint at a larger world beyond the photo. Um, so there's a lot of different things like that going on with this photo. Our next shot comes from Urenson and this is a photo of a person walking up, sta up some stairs and away from the camera. So the first thing, uh, those of you who have watched lots of knots of these videos over the last few years know exactly what I'm going to say first. And if you look at the landings of each of the platforms and also the foreground, they're all sloping down and to the right. So, uh, so one of the things that would it, let's imagine reframing this image a little bit. So we're going to crop it so that those landings in the foreground are all horizontal. Now that's going to do a lot to take care of some of the verticals in here, which you can see on the vertical wall in front of the subject. Those are also a little bit crooked. So those will get um, straightened out. Now imagine cropping up and from the left to get those trash cans out of the frame and also that bit of shadow in the foreground. So now the framing goes if we make it vertical, and now the framing goes down the left side just in front of those garbage cans, and then the bottom is just above that block of shadow, then what that does is makes the subject a slightly larger portion of the frame. It makes the stairway that they're walking up a substantially larger portion of the frame, and also gets rid of a couple of the distracting foreground elements that are in it. So if, there, if this were a posed photo, one way that might be, one thing that might be worthwhile to go back if you were to try to reshoot this would be to use an even tighter crop. Say if this is a 50 millimeter lens, it's kind of hard to say at a glance exactly what it is. It's probably close. But imagine this with something like a 100 millimeter lens or a 75, something in that range where you could stand in the same position and have the bottom of the frame be the bottom step and then the top of the frame be just the canopy right over the person, and then more of the photo becomes the person on the steps. Or you could lift the camera a bit and just have those middle two sections of steps and then the one beyond, and then get more of the canopy overhead. So um, there are a few different ways to, to reframe this, and I do like having an, an environmental portrait like this. I think in the first, first day of this week, in Monday, um, we talked about the the photo of the, the the person with the red hair on the walking down a walkway, and this is a, an image very much in that same vein. So um, a strong potential composition here. Just a couple things to tweak. This photo comes from Milan Sedic, and this is a chimney, chimney on the beach. Uh, over on the right, there's a Karen, and then uh, the ocean, and then this chimney. And that's kind of, it's kind of an interesting object, is it? It's, it's either a, a chimney or maybe it's like a uh, lookout post. Looks like there might be a door handle on, on what would be the right side of it, looking at the image. And uh, so there might be a way to get in there to, to look out at the top, or maybe it's a light tower or something. Anyway, it's an interesting object, right? Because we have this rocky shore with a couple plants, and then the ocean, and that's it. Everything is nature, except for this one 
very squared off man-made object. Everything on this thing is like, it's a square or a line. And so there's a really neat, uh, an interesting interplay here between shape, square versus organic, and texture, smooth carved rock versus jagged rough rocks, right? And also the texture of the sky and the texture of the water. Um, and then you get a nice, a nice tonal range and then some really nice high ISO grain. You know, if I had to guess, I'm going to guess this is probably like a FOMA 400, um, Ultrafine 400, uh, Arista 400, something like that film just based on the grain pattern. Could be, could be a faster delta like a 3200 as well. Um, but in this, because there's so much blankness in the sky, then the sky becomes dominated by this grain. And so what would be a blank, flat uh, thing, the sky, now also takes on texture, and that adds another depth of texture to the image. That's one of the really nice things about film. When people say, why film? Why? Like, this, this is why, because grain adds depth to your images that you just simply cannot get with digital. If this were digital and converted to black and white from digital, the most depth you could hope to get out of that sky would be some, you know, some interference banding or something like that. So um, I really like the composition of this image and uh, a lot of the things that are going on with the way that it was structured and composed. So good eye, Milan. Here's a portrait from Frank Wooters and a really good and solid composition and portrait. You've got a nice photo, whether this is, I'm assuming since I think this is the second photo we saw from Frank with the subject in it, in it, that this is somebody Frank knows, wife, daughter, girlfriend, who knows. Um, no wedding ring, so probably not wife. Anyway, uh, enough speculation. This is a a much different photo from the other one in that the outfit is substantially different, but then there's some similarities, right? Because if you remember in the previous one, she was wearing like a white outfit and leaning up against a wall. Here she is wearing a black outfit and sitting on top of a wall with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Um, so uh, very nice, uh, very nice travel photo and a really nice way to, uh, to capture a nice memory. And just from a technical perspective, like a very, very well executed photo. We have a nice range of, tone, of tones in here, really good texture and not too much grain. This is a fairly slow film or would it be digital? I, you know what? I'm looking at the sky and I couldn't tell you for sure whether this is a, an ultra low grain black and white film like a Delta 100 or if this is digital. Um, if Frank's watching this, there's a good chance he'll, he'll reveal some secrets in the comments. But from a technical perspective, if you look at, say, her right side, right, like there, it would be really easy for the, for the light to completely blow out her skin tones or to cast the left side of her face, which is the right side of the image here, into complete shadow. And none of that's happened. So really good uh, exposure quality here and really good use of, of lighting and not letting the light completely dominate and ruin the image. So again, as we saw with all of Frank's photos throughout this whole, um, whole week, really good control of light, consistent control of light throughout. That's a very hard thing to master. This photo comes from Eduardo Montero, and this is a really captivating portrait of, we could assume, his daughter or somebody's daughter. Obviously, somebody's daughter. Uh, a really interesting use of light here. So we have this in-scene light coming in through the window on the right side and illuminating what's in the background, right? And then also there's a light outside of the frame, off to, off to the left of the frame, which we can tell because it's illuminating her face. Maybe it's a television, maybe it's supposed to be her looking at a television, or it could be another open window, or something artificial like a strobe meant to simulate uh, some other sort of commonplace source of light. But one of the things I find really interesting about this photo is that the subject is completely disengaged with the photographer and, and therefore the viewer and completely engaged with what's over just outside of the frame. So if, it, you know, talking about things to, to do slightly differently with this, super nitpicky, that bag in the bottom right hand corner, if, if, we, uh, if we imagine this photo without that, it does uh, change it significantly to, to have that because that's, that's a distracting element right now, right? But other than that, um, 
it looks it's a pretty darn good image and you can see also this this lens whatever lens you used was shot pretty wide open because there's a nice softness in the portrait that comes from the lens being shot wide open um, so nicely done on choosing your composition and your lighting and your subject for this shot this next photo I stared at for a while because I, I could not at first figure out what was going on with this. But this comes to us from A.D. King, and this is a reflection of water underneath some tractor trailers, semi-trailers, whatever you want to call them, right? And um, yeah, this one, this one took me a few minutes to figure out. So I really like from it, again, we're going to say that I'm going to say this a lot in this video, really good technical execution on this photo. Because if you, now this is clearly a digital photo, and I'm going to guess that it was shot in RAW with some significant work done in the RAW file uh, prior to the black and white conversion. Because if we, we look at the things like the rims, that's like flirting with HDR levels of detail in black and white. HDR in black and white, as I th I've said before, I think doesn't bother me at all. And uh, it's, it's a long, it's a technique that was used for a long time before digital came out. So we've got detail under the water that's in the shadows, we've got the detail of the rocks under the water that's in mid shadows, and then we lose that detail where it's super bright. Just fine, by the way, because that gives the water a little bit of depth where you have detail underneath the, the trailers and then where you don't. That creates this contrast of surface reflection versus peering into the water giving you depth. Then you also have detail of the under carriage of this closest trailer which is like that's going to be very dark under there so there's a lot of really good shadow detail retention in this okay so you've and, and you've got multiple types of depth you've got the depth of what's in the reflected scene that's going you know up into the sky you've got the depth of the water versus this reflection of the water and then you've got the depth going back over what looks like four semi trailers worth of worth of parked park trailers right uh, to that fence in the background. So in terms of the way that the the space is constructed within this image, it's a really creative and interesting use of folding all of these different dimensions of depth into a two-dimensional image. Uh, the only distracting elements I would point out in this are on the left side, you've got the, uh, I don't know, whatever that little gray bar down there at the very left corner is, a little bit of text on on that one mud flap and then some up, upside down text in the bottom middle. Other than that, like, um, again, really exceptional image, which should hint at how good the images at the end of this video are going to be. This photo comes to us from Tom Domenico, and this is a, a photo of some mailboxes. And as we've talked a lot about with tone and texture and depth, a lot of that's really going on in, very well in this photo. Also, like you can see the depth in the curving of the street. You can see different textures in the mailboxes, metal and then the wood, and a lot of different tonal ranges in the shadows in the top right, and then the slice of light that's coming over through it, catching a little bit of the photographer's shoulder in the bottom left corner. Um, really good use of selective focus as well, because the trees are blurry. The street in the foreground is blurry and then off to the side you get a little bit of detail but it's not distracting and the, the way that the focus works is it draws you to especially that front that front mailbox but the mailboxes in general so it's a really good use of selective focus and it's a really good use of of having the plane of sharp focus work with the structure of the image so really good uh really good structure of your image right there and a really clever way of approaching the subject. This photo comes from Tim Peters and yes, Ford Escape Club. Um, anyway, another really good use of black and white because we've got different textures and different tones throughout. And you know, those are things that consistently are going to show up as being done well in these. And a big part of that is because of the number of you guys who watch the, these videos who really are stunningly, stunningly good phot photographers and who can look at a scene like this and say, what are the interesting elements of it? And that, that 
building in the background, the old, what looks like it's probably weathered wood building in the background, is a really interesting photographic element, especially the way that things like the electrical lines, the satellite dish, and so forth have been retrofitted onto it over time. And then we've got this brick uh, building over on the right side, which is, again, an, an interesting element to it. And then this super dirty, driven in the snow, uh, you know, compact SUV. So um, it, there are a couple things with framing here that, that let's, let's try and re revise this framing just slightly and see with it see how it would look in our imaginations if we instead of having it be a square frame what if we imagine something that was more like a 645 or standard aspect ratio but we cut out the bottom right so that the the, the tire tracks were were not in the foreground um, maybe that maybe that benefits the image maybe it doesn't right now the foreground is just the tire tracks in kind of a uniform gray so it's not really adding anything to the overall uh, photo right then over on the right side we've got part of a sign so what if we tilted the camera slightly to the left we could crop out that sign just have the the, the edge of the frame be right where that shadow is like maybe split the middle of that shadow from the sign and then over on the left, that would give us that whole doorway, right? So that the door wasn't cropped slightly on the left side. So um, anyway, I, th I think this is a, 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 there's a lot of good things to be said about taking photos of interesting buildings with black and white because it draws out a lot of interesting character in them. And uh, there's, it's a, it's a very rich, large format tradition to photograph buildings in black and white with large format cameras, especially buildings like this. And uh, so so in that way, this photo is really tapping into that, that tradition of high-end black and white building photography. This photo comes from Rich Mander, and this is a photo of uh, Arthur Duke of the Arthur Duke of Wellington statue, I'm assuming based on what I can read of the, uh, the text there. So as, as I've said in a number of other photos throughout the the series here that the text can become a distracting element one of the things that's really working very well in this photo is the incorporation of two people because it shows scale if those people weren't there how big would the statue be is it like a little finial on top of a newel post or is it this gigantic statue we need the people to tell us the scale People, when, when you're trying to deal with, with scale in an image, whether it's a landscape or a statue like this or anything where you're trying to convey a sense of size, either very large size or very small, having a person in that image is a really good reference point for it. Or having something that someone can use as, as a scale indicator is a good way to give a reference of size. Otherwise, Converting something three-dimensional and turning it into a two-dimensional image for people who have never seen it before, it can be really easy to lose that sense of scale. So the, um, this, this would be a really hard image to reframe if we wanted to do it because we've got the barricades down on the bottom that are just slightly cut off. If we lifted the camera, we, we could cut those off, yes, but then we'd lose some of the text which would be frustrating and we'd also lose the people below the waist which would make them a, a less uh, an, an element that doesn't give the sense of scale. In this case, I would say if it's possible possible to lower the camera, capture the entire barricades, capture the entire people, that would also give this statue a bit of grounding with the setting that it's actually rested in. So, um, from a technical perspective, as, as we've seen with Rich's other photos, the technical work is done very very well here with really good shadow and highlight retention. Uh, good, perfect, you know, the focus is where it, it should be in this photo. So, uh, and a really good use of tone, texture, and and the whole range of grayscale tones across the image. So very well done in all of those regards. Uh, this photo from Garrett Dennington, we see again the um, Kaufman Performing Arts Center, as we now know it's called from, from yesterday's video. And this is, I think, one of the really good executions of this series because it's different than the rest of them, right? The rest of them showed an aspect of the building, the shape of that, that one part over on the left or this one part over on the right. This shows where those two different parts come together. 
and then it plants the camera in the natural environment and also has a bunch of grass right in front of the camera that's out of focus. So this is a very interesting use of foreground blur, which is not a commonly used element in photos. I don't use it. I'm, I'm trying to struggle. I, I, I can't remember the last time I had a blurry object in the foreground of an image. In this image, that works. And it's, it's something that contributes to it because the, the texture of the blurry grass contrasts to the texture of the smooth building and also the tones of the grass contrast to the darks and the lights of the building and so forth. So this is a really uh, interesting execution of this series for all of those reasons. This photo comes from Gabriel Silva's and this is a photo of, I'm assuming based on the setting, the um, a headstone at a cemetery. So there are, this is a very high contrast image uh, of, compared to what's in the rest of this, this today's videos. We have very little shadow retention and very little highlight retention. So there's a little bit of highlight retention in, in the, 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 the headstone that, or the monument, whatever it is, right in front of us, but the sky has lost it all. The trees have no highlights. The, the trees have almost no shadows. And then the statue also has very few shadows in it. And for this subject, I think that works pretty well because the subject just by losing the detail of the, of the statue part of it becomes just a form of uh, sort of almost a silhouette, not quite within the background. There are a couple of things that I would say, let's take a look at how we could do a few things differently here. One of the things that's curious is that if you look on the left side, that tree looks like it's vertical. And then the tree that's just past that brick wall on the left side also looks like it's vertical. But the whole image looks like it's off kilter, right? So the, the verticals in the wall, the verticals in the monument in the back that looks sort of like the Washington Monument, those are uh, those are not vertical. So if we imagine tilting this image so that the vertical of the statue is vertical, everything else is is going to be fine, right? It'll it'll fall into place as it needs to. Um, and then the other thing would be, if if there were a way to get the the front of this statue with this background, which I know there isn't, but if there are a way to do that, that would be a, a really interesting and more engaging photo. Because right now. You've, you've got the, the statue facing away from you, which could be, yes, conveying a message of the person who, the, who, is, who is buried at this, this uh, statue having left. Um, it would be worth seeing what this image would look like walking 90 degrees to the left and then photographing it with the statue in the facing the, the camera. Uh, I don't know what the background would be over there, probably more gravestones. Maybe that, that might be where the light source is coming from. But um, that could be a different way to envision this subject as well. This photo comes from David Cockerell, and this is a photo looking up at uh, a building from some number of stories below it. And we saw one of these in one of the earlier videos this week. And it was a blue and white building and basically would say about the same things here as I would say about that, that photo, right? Which is that the, the verticals are a bit off here. And just looking up with the lens is always going to lead to keystoning. You can correct that in most of the good, if not all of the good, photo editing softwares. If you're printing this in the in the, the dark room, you can also correct that by really stopping down your enlarger lens all the way as far as it'll go, and then tilting the pl uh, the the easel that the paper is on, because you can print with a tilted easel and capitalize on um, and treat that sort of like having motion in a tilt shift lens uh, in the same way that you would during capture. You can do that during printing. You, uh, it just, the same thing if applies in printing as it does in capture. Depth of field will shift and uh, that's why you need to stop your lens all the way down. So, or potentially even make a custom pinhole aperture uh, for your enlarging lens if you need to tilt the easel a lot. So at any rate, um, you know, the the only thing I could say that would 
you know, those those things are there. And then everything else I would have said about that, the previous image, if, you know, we have that, that wall of glass up on the top that looks like it's leading to an open space, judging by the strings of overhead lights above it, that's probably used for socializing. If there were somebody walking up there or two people leaning up against the glass having a drink or somebody, uh, you know, leaning over it, smoking a cigar or something like that, that would add a visual interest that would be really interesting. But right now, um, just that human engagement is, you know, it, it's not there. So that's the sort of thing that human engagement with a shot like this is going to be really hard to get unless you know somebody up there and you can get them to do something for you. This photo car comes from Carlos Diaz, and it's a picture of a couple of pigeons flying out from underneath a bridge uh, or flying into it to, to land underneath the bridge. It's kind of hard to tell because they're just silhouettes. From a technical perspective, this is a really, really hard capture, especially on film, because the dynamic range here of the darkness under this bridge and the brightness of the light in the background is, uh, that's, that's a huge amount of range for, for any film. So from a, from a technical perspective, this is an exceptionally good capture. Because yes, we have a lot of the, um, we do have some, some shadow loss, but that really contributes to the mood of this specific setting. And one of the things I think that's really interesting and a, a good choice about uh, this particular location is it beyond that second bridge, it looks like it's jungle or like at least it's got overgrown plants, right? So we're at this point where it's transitioning from feeling like a city. It, you know, you get the sense that with the graffiti and some of the markings under here that there's probably a city in the background to all of a sudden not city. And this is a really fascinating location for that reason. Uh, also, uh, as you, you'll have noticed, and I've, I've mentioned a few times, verticals are vertical, horizontals, horizontal, really good attention to detail with getting all of those elements lined up correctly. And uh, so we've got that, that dynamic range, we've got the, the, the interesting location, the, the technical accuracy. We've also got a really good use of different textures in the concrete, in the plants in the background, in the water as well, we've got other textures. So a lot of really good elements here of the black and of black and white photography combining it to make combining together to make a pretty successful image. This photo comes from Samuel West, and this is you know, it looks like another pinhole photo, but it's almost like too shallow a depth of field. So I'm, it, I don't think it's a pinhole photo. But what we've got is a photo that's inside of a, a cathedral, a very tall cathedral, with lighting either from uh, below or uh, around this cross with the rest of the cathedral out of focus in background. Really good use of selective focus with this shot and a really interesting angle that most people aren't going to see when they walk into a cathedral. Most people don't get up into the pulpit area. Um, so this is, this is a very interesting and different perspective on this subject than I think I've ever seen before. Um, so really well done there. And I also, by the way, really like how dark this image is. You lose a lot of shadow detail in here, especially in the background. And I think that, and, and in the foreground, by the way, and that really draws the background and foreground together, having no shadow detail in them. And I think that that's a really interesting way to approach the subject because it draws attention to the foreground, uh, just like having that be the focus point does. And then having the, um, the rest of the image just be this sort of mid-tone gray with a few highlights for the lights themselves really creates a very pleasing composition. This photo comes from Franciszek Menhart, and this is a portrait of somebody, and whether the photographer knows him or not, it's kind of hard to say. Really interesting uh, portrait. The, the, the person in here is somebody who's just got a lot of presence within the image and makes a really good and interesting photographic subject. So, um, kind of curious about what they're holding in their hand. Can't figure it out. I'm curious how they injured their hand as well. Um, so the, the, um, some of the things that are really working well in this, this is a, this is 
like a high mid key image, right? The last one we saw was solidly low key, but this one's got a little bit of skewing onto the higher key. We can see because the shadow under the hat still has detail, the 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 jacket or or whatever it is still has some it looks like a fairly dark color, but it's still got its detail in it and then the sky is pretty well blown out, which is just fine for the setting. Uh, really good use of selective focus here because the subject's face from, from the tip of his nose to, to uh, like middle of his ears, right on, right in focus. Exactly what should be in focus with a portrait like this is in focus. And he's doing something interesting. Like we, I, I can't tell you just by looking at it what he's doing. He's holding a thing in his mouth. Maybe he's, maybe he's wrapping his own cigarette. It's kind of hard to say. So, and then also the uh, coma that whatever lens that you used for this has some coma and you can see it in the background with the swirling right of the blurry areas and that and that creates a um, b because it's not in the entire background it creates a roof to this image by uh, having a different sort of texture and um, a really nice way to keep the viewers eyes from wandering up and keeping the viewer looking at the subject. So if there were anything uh, to look at differently with this photo, it, it might be worth seeing if you could crop it so that the vertical part of the bricks that are on the right side that he's sitting on, what if those were made vertical? Because those combined with the um, angle of the sign are uh, distracting and make it seem like the whole image is, is cockeyed. But other than that, like in terms of uh, uh, another thing you could potentially do would be what would happen if, if you know this person, if you were able to take a shot like this again, what if you got three or four steps closer to them, right? What if this was like a waist up portrait with the same general composition? So a few different things to look at with how that, how that could go, but this is a good and pleasing portrait. So this photo comes from Lucas and I'm, I'm going to try her last name this video. I feel like I should. Um, Zach Nowicks. I'm hoping that's close. So Lucas sent in this photo of a moored boat. It looks, it's hard to tell whether it's it, its abandoned. It doesn't look it, because it doesn't look like it's overgrown, but it's a moored boat in some, uh, some reeds or cattails along either a river or a canal or something like that. It looks like it could potentially be somebody's houseboat. Um, really, <laughs> it's a really captivating photo. It's using all of the really great details that we talk, we've talked about throughout this video of black and white uh, that, that are inherent to black and white photography. It's using all of them really well. Tone, texture, you, you know, you can kind of feel the different textures of this image. And a really nice detail. Also a really nice perspective of standing across the river, looking out, or this little waterway, looking out at this boat, and then you get a little hint of, oh, there's something behind there. What is it that's behind there? Maybe maybe a building, hard to say. Um, and then also the the structure of this image where it's where the vanishing point is off to the, to the left outside of the frame and everything's sort of being pulled that way uh, forces the viewer to look across the whole boat and take in the whole subject. So I think that's really neat, and I, I enjoyed this image a lot. This photo comes from Mangle, and this is a photo of some uh, some grasses and water. Uh, really strong image here. I really enjoyed the use of reflection. You can see the, the grass reflecting on the water, the use of light and dark against this gray tone water, and also the use of depth, because if you look in the foreground, you can see some of the stuff that's under the water, and it's mixing with the reflections of the sky that are on the water. And so, as we've talked about with the, with the truck photo from A.D. King, you get a mixing of different depths when that happens. You get a mixing of, of very nearby, very far away, and it adds dimensionality to a two-dimensional image. And also, just, just the, the, the waviness of the reflections of the grass in the foreground are really, really interesting to look at. So, this was a really wonderful capture. Um, was was when I when I do these videos I'll I'll create the photo first second honorable mention and then one that I call rest which isn't the best name but it's it's a place where I group the rest 
And then I, I limit the honorable mentions to five photos. And this was when I got down to like the last seven. This was one of the last two that I was really debating whether it, it went in here or the honor, honorable mentions. It was right there neck and neck with those. So I uh, really enjoyed this capture. This shot comes from Steve Boyce, and this is a really interesting portrait. And uh, so I'll give you a second to look and see if you can p pick out what I'm picking out here. And if you're going with the subject, it has a very still face. It's motionless. There's no motion blur, but there is in her hair and her dress. That's telling us that this is a long, relatively long exposure portrait. Long, you know, her legs aren't moving, her hand isn't. I'm guessing there is a breeze here. And this was probably somewhere in the quarter to half second range tops. Uh, just enough to capture the wind moving, moving her dress and her hair just a little bit. So uh, really good use of tonal range and capturing good shadow details and not having blown out highlights. The only, th the only things that I really struggled with in this photo were the background becomes a distracting element because it's in sharp focus. So it looks like the subject's round about four and a half, five feet in front of the background. And uh, with a full body shot, that's not quite enough distance, to, uh, even with a larger aperture, to get the background out of focus with a full body shot of a subject. Because, you know, as depth of field increases as focus, as focus distance increases, right? So let's say a 50 millimeter lens, f1.8, at infinity, you're gonna have a suitable depth of field that goes from around 50 feet to infinity. But up here, where the photographer is probably about seven or eight feet in front of the subject, uh, I'm gonna guess that to get the, 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 the exposure length that we, we can see here, that he probably stopped down to round about f8. Um, judging by the detail that we see in the wall, five, six to eight, somewhere in that range. And um, that's a really good aperture for a portrait. It just means that you're going to need a little bit more distance into the background with your, uh, with your portrait. This photo comes from Lucas Apti. I, I kind of know how he did this. So this looks like a circular mirror probably like a bicycle or a motorcycle or an old car mirror, judging by the arm that's coming off to the left. And he's focused on what's in the mirror and then let the background go out of focus. This is a really interesting use of focus because the whole mirror isn't focused. Like it looks like whatever this thing is, it's cupped because you can see around the peripheries, that's blurry and it's blurring towards the middle. And then what's in the the middle is more in focus. So this might not be like a, a bicycle mirror after all. After all. Um, anyway, I, I'm not exactly sure what that is, and, but, but it's not important. The, so the, the, one of the things that's really interesting about the thing that's used to capture this reflection is the way that the blurriness of the background merges together into the blurriness of the periphery of this thing that then transitions into a sharper central area. And uh, it's, you know, abstract photos are really hard to execute well. And this isn't like strictly an abstract because you can still glom onto something in the center and, and have a sense of what it is. But this is definitely flirting with abstract territory and it's a good execution of, of that. This is a lovely photo of some mountain ridges, I'm assuming, in fog. And man, fog in black and white just is amazing. So really love the way that this, this photo captures three different ridges. So, so we've got some depth there. And the way that the fog gets denser, of course, as it does, uh, and so that the furthest ridge has got the least detail and, the, and then the fog is wrapped around each of them and it looks actually like they're, they're going down into the ocean there in the bottom right corner. And that's, that's fine for this image. We definitely don't need the ocean detail because it's all about how the fog is interacting with the, uh, with the ridges and so we have this interplay of light and dark and texture and smoothness and mm, yeah. This is a really, really good image uh, that, that just really stands out. So nicely done on this one, Ali. 
This photo comes to us from Dmitry Ochaika, and this is another photo that uh, is from Ukraine, and we can tell that this this building seems to have taken some hits. So, um, one of the things I really like about this photo in particular is the way that it places the photographer behind some obstacles, right? There's a couple of trees, this this pillar on the right side, and and then there's a what looks like part of a bench over there on the left. But the photographer is back from this building, and it at least feels like the photographer is under, uh, you know, protected by this cover, which does a lot to really put the viewer in the scene, right? Because we can we can make the assumption that this this building was somehow targeted for an attack, right? Because it's got damage and it's in an active war zone. Doesn't take a lot to make that that leap. So, looking at it, we can um, we can make those assumptions and taking the photo in such a way that it makes it feel like the the viewer is hunkering down with the photographer makes the viewer feel like they are more in the scene with the pho- with the uh, photographer as this is happening. That's a really good approach to recording this subject. If, imagine if if this photo had been taken up by where that that tree in the front is. And it's it's a building. It's kind of a wrecked building. That would be all the photo is. So the setting that the photographer chose for this shot is what makes it much much more than the subject. This is a a, an example where setting makes the sub uh, setting makes the image. So well done on picking out that location, Demetrio. And this is the last before we get to the runners up. And this photo comes to us from Brian Ray. And this photo is a picture of someone midair on a diving board. So you've heard me many times say the text in this photo, this is an exception. It honestly doesn't bother me at all in this photo having some text there in the background. Um, what, so I love the nature of this capture, that this person is like frozen in midair and they're, they're going to go into the water. This is, there's a lot in this photo that really feels like a classic, fo- uh, a classic, really exceptional photo. So, the the only issue I would note here is that the 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 focus is on the trees in the background, and not the subject. The subject's in front of the focus. So so that's a, that's a detraction. But the composition here is really good. The freezing the subject is really good. The setting really great from a technical perspective. The exposure is spot on. This was a really, really well executed photo. So good job on that, Brian. All right, let's get on to the honorable mentions. So these were very hard to pick and there I ended up going with four of them for, for this category um, because it's, these four are just absolute standout photos. And we're gonna pick this first one from Dave Carrera, which is a photo of a tree over water at night. And the way that the tree and the lighting in it is reflected in the water, it's just, this is a stunning photo. And you can see there's a person on the right side giving the scale and over on the left as well. And just, this this is such a well, well executed photo. Just wonderful use of in-scene lighting wonderful use of light and dark, uh, just a really great reflection, really great subject, perfect location. Um, I mean, yeah, this is, this is a, a stunningly, stunningly good photo. This next one comes from Andrei Jel- Jelakovich, and it's a photo of two kids, uh, I'm assuming looks like they're kids, on a street. And uh, I love the way that the two characters are interacting here, and the way that you have just such strong light and dark tones in this image. One character is wearing a white shirt, one's wearing black. You have a very strong light off to the right, very dark shadows off to the left. You know, um, really good capture. The, the from a technical perspective, like the verticals are vertical. You, you guys hear me harp on that that a lot. Uh, the the tonal range is really good. The use of shadow and light is spot on in this image. Just the way that the the light on the on the kid with the white shirt is reflecting on his cheek and nose, and then uh, on the cheeks and nose and, and chin of the kid in the black shirt. It's just, uh, you know, this is 
this is a this photo is an absolute joy to look at and a wonderful capture. Uh, if I had any single detraction, it would be the the menus on the left side because they're so much whiter than the surrounding dark area uh, that they're a little bit distracting. I might go in and clone those out, you know, to something that, that matches whatever's below the menus in that in that holder. But uh, other than that, that's that's super nitpicky. This next photo comes from Jared King, and uh, Jared submitted this one photo, just like rolling the dice. Let's see what I can do this year. And uh, so he submitted one photo of an engineer on what looks like an old steam locomotive and uh, really an amazing setting with this photo. You've got the engineer wearing these like um, glacier glasses almost. Yeah, actually looks like they're full on glacier glasses with side protectors and everything. And uh, just uh, which is kind of a weird look. It, it's sort of a steampunk look, which is almost fitting given that given that this is a steam locomotive um and the uh the tonal range in this is a little bit truncated but the contrast is really good and that's a good approach for this kind of subject and then we've got a really good framing in this uh, in this image you have just enough of the framing to know what this guy is riding in and then the subject him he is in sharp focus he's the absolute perfect point of focus and uh we so so we know so we know when we see exactly what's supposed to be the the subject and and then uh just enough of what's around him so so we've got him in his uh environment really uh for the third year running jared an exceedingly well executed portrait well done and our last honorable mention is going to be this train car and we saw from uh, Randall Dunphy, and we saw in one of the earlier videos this week this same shoot. This looks like it's the train car that was in the back of that previous photo, and I, th I think at that point I said it would be a, an interest. The one in the back would be an interesting photographic subject, and it looks like looks like I was uh, at least I'm consistent on my my taste, right? So this is a really good take on that subject. So whereas the previous photo that we talked about with these cars was look, was a almost certain that was a film photo um, from what I remember of it. This looks like a, a digital black and white photo, which by the way is just fine. Um, there is no requirement to use film for these contests, but this has a really great use of, of contrast, a really great use of light and dark, and that's that grittiness of the, the light and the dark and the contrast and the, the texture that black and white brings out really does a lot to contribute to the, the feel of the train car here. And it's uh, really uh, very well executed in terms of capturing the atmosphere of the subject. And you get just enough of the setting around the subject to be really curious, like why are there, there are three abandoned train cars here? And you know, it's just, it leaves a lot of questions for the viewer to answer on their own. And that's always a good approach when taking a photo. A photo like a story that answers every single question is one that's going to close the viewer's mind to thinking about it in the future. So that takes us to our runner up for this category. And so there are two people out there right now who are like fingers crossed, like, oh, is it, who, where am I going to land? The runner up is coming to us from Sunny Zhao. And this is a photo of a, a hut in front of mountains in the snow with an amazing absolutely amazing reflection in the uh, in the lake there. This is just a stunning, stunning capture. Uh, you, you know, if I have one thing to nitpick, it would be that the snow drift in front of the house is a little bit blown out, but that's basically impossible to prevent. Everything across the board on this is ticking every box that makes a phenomenal black and white landscape photo. We've got really good composition. We've got appropriate balance of the different elements in the framing. The, the house is an appropriate size. It's got the trees going off to the right. The trees shape of increasing towards the right sort of reflects the shape of the mountain on the left side. We've got mountains in the distance. We've got snow right up at the foreground. And if you look at the foreground snow, you can make out the edges of the snow right there at the bottom of the frame and it's in focus, and then so is the mountain in the background. So this is a wide angle lens. I'd, I'd be hesitant to, 
to guess how wide it is, but it's it's probably, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to guess. I'm going to guess it's somewhere in the 20 millimeter range, um, 20 to 24 millimeter range. And, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that, Sonny. Um, but we've got a nice, just right in front of the lens to very far in infinity, depth of field, and um, just tons and tons of classic landscape image elements. So if there were, if there were, uh, the only thing, the only thing I would say, if there were an opportunity to take this photo again, I might bring some ND filters, or um, since this is digital, you could take like a long sequence and then blend them together if you have Photoshop using the statistics and then mean on a cloudy day like this, if you had say two minutes worth of exposure, you could also get the clouds moving in the sky and that would also be reflected in that motion in the in the um, reflection in the, the pond as well. Totally optional um, because this is in and of itself as taken an absolutely amazing photo. So our winner knows who he is uh, and now it's time to reveal to the rest of the world. It comes to us from Stephen Boski and this is another one of his portraits and I think not only his best portrait of his portfolio, I think it is the best portrait we saw this year in all of the, in all of the, uh, the different categories. This is an absolutely spot on portrait. We've got, we can tell a lot about this person. Like we can tell he's a skater, right? He's got the skateboard, but he's also like dressed appropriately for what skaters wear. The same type of necklace and, and, uh, and, and, uh, bracelets that a lot of skaters wear. He's got a really interesting photographic persona. Not only does he have really uh, a very interesting uh, hairdo, but he's like asymmetrical, right? Like perfect symmetry is not something you, are, you really want in a person's face because it's kind of boring to look at. This guy's got one cheek that's higher than the rest, a slightly crooked smile. He's like half, He's he's got uh, like kind of skeptical looking with his right eye and then his left eye is like a more interesting more like subject focused and interested it's sort of like he's focused on multiple things at once right and just a very distinctive set of features and then if you look down at uh, where this where the tip of the skateboard is it looks like he's got some kind of scar on his chest as well which what's the story behind that um so just a whole lot here that is really distinctive about the subject. Amazing use of subject isolation in this photo. So he's sharply in focus, right? And you can see, like, if you look around the peripheries of his arms, all those little, little thin hairs are in focus, and then background is blurry, right? So this, this was either taken wide open or very nearly wide open, looking at the, the background blur uh, characteristics and the, the lack of shape to the out of focus area specular highlights. And what's incredible to me is that um, everything from his finger, finger, his knuckles and his fingers, like that's in focus. And so are his shoulders, like, and, and also the hair behind his neck, you can see that is just on the verge of maybe going a little bit out of focus. So in terms of, of using aperture, to perfectly capture a subject from in focus in a portrait right here that this photo is how that is done so um exemplary work on this Stephen. so that is it for this contest for the black and white category rather tomorrow we'll take a look at all of the portfolios and ask who won the overall best portfolio we'll see you then